Are New Year's resolutions biblical? And if Christians are going to be making New Year's resolutions, what kind of resolutions should they be making? And as we look into next year, as what this ministry has going forward, we place it in the hands of the Lord and would love to share with you some of the ideas and passions that we have for the next year. To discuss this very important topic over the next year is none other than the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. Praise God, Chad. I know everybody's, uh, a lot of people are making New Year's resolutions. And yeah, is it unbiblical? Is it biblical? And uh, if it's biblical, I mean, you know, what kind of resolutions that we've been making as Christians? A lot of Christians, are they, is Christ going to be first in their lives in regard to the resolutions or is it going to be kind of kind of a self-help year where it's just focused on a better me where Christ is left kind of as the co-pilot, you know? Yeah, amen. I, I think that's the biggest thing is when we're starting out with this, first and foremost, if you're just resolving right now to say, I'm going to make Jesus Lord, well, praise God that you've come to faith, but let's not just do it for a year or for a month and have the spiritual gym only full during January. But this is something where we can talk about, I guess, that first question up front which is whether or not we should make these resolutions. Now, obviously, Joe, I, I caveat that with G Jesus was very clear that we're not to make oaths. We make our yes, our yes, our no, yeah. be no. Amen. But in terms of making these, you know, make, resolving yourself to do something, is that something that we can do as believers? Oh, man. I mean, uh, you know what? When you get into start saying you can and can't do things and there's no scripture, the Bible says not to go beyond what's written. So the last thing we want to do is start being like the Pharisees because Jesus had a lot of things to say against religious leaders who taught the doctrines of men as though they were the commandments of God. And they bound people and put heavy weights on people. So to tell people it's a sin to make a New Year's resolution or something like that, uh, where does it say that in Scripture? Where is there any clear Scripture on that? Uh, now, now, if you're making a New Year's resolution, you know, to, you know, your, your, your goal in life becomes something contrary to the Scripture. So we can say, no, it's not wrong to make a New Year's resolution. I mean, how many people have said, man, I, my New Year's resolution is to read the Bible through a year? And they got really blessed. They got convicted. They grew close to the Lord. They feared him more. They loved him more. And so forth. That's happened probably millions of times over, uh, things like that anyway. So we would never say you can't make a New Year's resolution. Uh, but the question is, is what kind of resolutions should we be making as believers? And unfortunately, a lot of millions of professing believers will make resolutions where Jesus isn't first on the list. I think, uh, you know, the, it says in Second Peter, or actually in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, that we're not only supposed to be ready to, with reverence, you know, uh, and gentleness to give an answer to everyone who asks about the hope that's in us, but it says to make sure you set Christ as Lord in your heart. Yeah, that's starting point. And yeah. he's saying that to believers. So I think for a believer, the first and foremost resolution that we should always have, not just when the New Year's coming, but every day of our lives, but many professing believers aren't doing this. So some are saying, you know what? I want to put Lord, I want to put God first in my life. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. And it's like, well, you can't really be a believer a true believer, unless Christ is first in your life, by the way. And that should be where we all start. But you know what? Each believer, you know, the Bible talks about how people can become lukewarm, Chad, or their love uh, for Christ could grow cold, Chad, in that church of Ephesus, which, by the way, is evidence <laughs> that uh, Revelation was written later because the church of Ephesus has love for Christ. But at that point, obviously, uh, they their, their love for Christ died out uh, and you know, he says somewhat against you because thou hast left thy first love. So I think every one of us should make it a resolution to make sure Jesus is our first love. Uh, the, the greatest commandment, Jesus said, is to love your Lord, your God, with your whole heart, soul, strength, and mind. So one of the things I've been thinking about is I that's my heart every morning when I wake up. That's my heart every day. But also when I think of the new year, it's like, God, you're first. How can I more exalt you? How can I give greater glory to you? How can I exalt Jesus more in my life, more in ministry, more in my preaching, more in the way I treat my family and my loved ones and, and my enemies, you know? Uh, because Jesus said, you know, he that's not with me is against me. He has to be first. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The Lord's prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, all these scriptures, Jesus says, you can't be my disciple unless you, you deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So he said, you can't serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other, John 6, 24. Uh, so all these different scriptures uh, emphasize how Christ has to be first in our lives. And everything should be considered dung by way of comparison. Uh, Philippians, Paul mentions all these 
accolades he received as a Jew among Jews of Pharisees, the Pharisees from the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day. They said he considered all these things as rubbish, as mere dung compared to the glory, compared to Christ and, and following him. And uh, that's where our hearts need to be. And he talks about how I press on, not that I've yet obtained perfection, but I press on that it might be part of the out resurrection, which is the ek resurrection, out from among the dead. In other words, not the resurrection of those who go to the lake of fire, but those who are resurrected to eternal life. So that's very, very important that that's our main resolution always. Hey Amen. And now uh, it'd be great to go over some practical ways with you as well. Things that you may a- be able to set aside for yourself and say, I'm going to resolve to do these things. I know that the most common one in the world is losing weight, right? Most people are like, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do these things. But there are things that need to be first and foremost. God's word is very clear. When it comes to this, it says, for physical training is of little value. And that's not saying there's no value to it, but comparatively, comparatively, to spiritual training, it's a very little value because spiritual training is for training in all things for this life and, the, and life to come. the life to come. So that's the most important. And I think that Christians, if I say the world has this most popular, I think Christians, and you already mentioned it, but maybe we could talk a little bit about maybe planning this out because that's one of the biggest things. When you're resolved to do something, you got to set forth some sort of plan because the Bible also says in the book of Proverbs that a man plans his way and the Lord directs his steps. There's no spiritual meandering that that's a spiritual gift. It's actually setting aside plans, saying, Lord, I, I want to do this and I want to do it, and, and setting aside some plans. So, Joe, when it comes to this first one, this is most common. And I would say this as an encouragement, something that I did as a younger believer that kind of stuck with me, and that was putting Psalm chapter 1 as the image that I would see when I grab my phone. Psalm chapter 1 is really clear. It says, if you meditate on the word of God day and night, you'll be like the tree planted against the water that bears fruit in its season. And if you don't, you'll be like the chaff or the bark that breaks off when the wind blows by. So I wanted to make sure that convicting scripture was on my face. Anytime I was going to open my phone, I had to see that before opening it so that I would be convicted to make sure I'm in the word before I'm checking anything else, sports scores or anything, right? I want to make sure that I read the word and have that on my heart. But in in terms of setting forth a plan, you know, we have different people say, hey, I want to read the Bible in a year. Uh, I think last year I did, I want to read a Bible in a month. I was like, I wonder what kind of, you know, what that would, that would look like. And some people are like, I want to read the Bible four times this year, whatever it may be. But just setting forth kind of a plan to have these things written on your heart. And before we even get into the plan, I want to read this. This is the Beth portion, the second portion, as when you look at Psalm 119, which 176 verses, there's only one verse that doesn't reference the Word of God in some capacity. Yeah, it's amazing. And it literally goes through the alphabet. It's kind of a long chapter, too. Yeah, it's very long. The longest (laughs) chapter in the Bible. And when you look at this, I just want to read from Beth. It's Aleph. Beth is the second letter. So just like A, B, C. And this portion right here is one that I've just loved, and this should set forth your resolution to resolve yourself to read the Word of God. Here's what it says. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your Word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your Word I have treasured or hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips Mm -hmm. I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. I just, I love that portion of Psalm 119. There are a ton of verses to write on your heart from this chapter and from the Bible as a whole, but just as a starting point for, hey, maybe you should be reading the Word and meditating on it day and night. It's a good starting point. Amen, Chad. And I really love what you just said. Uh, and since you mentioned meditating on the Scripture, it's kind of funny because we haven't compared notes on this at all. Uh, that's one of the things that it's, I think Chad and I have been radically blessed by God and, and many of you as well. Uh, any of you who div- dive into God's Word and meditate upon it, you get radically blessed. Mm. And he's talking about prospering, Chad. You want to prosper? I mean, that that passage there in, in in Psalm chapter 1, the first few verses there, contrasts it with the wicked who sits in the council of the wicked and so forth, mm-hmm. isn't meditating God's Word and blows away like chaff. But those who prosper, kind of like 
uh, Joshua 1.8, you know, he tells Joshua is the leader of Israel, bringing Amen. them into the promised land, that he'll prosper. We're not talking about getting a big giant mansion and a Rolls Royce and all that stuff. We're talking about real prosperity, spiritual prosperity, where you're close with God, which blows any of that away, right? And if he gives you a house or whatever, and whatever he gives you and blesses you with, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus says, all these things will be added to you. Uh, he can He can give you things and bless you things, bless you with things. I mean, with food and covering, though, we're supposed to be content. Real prosperity is having an intimate relationship with the Lord. And that happens when we respond to his love letter to us, his word, and we meditate upon that love letter. It draws us close to him because, Chad, it says that, you know, we love him because he first loved us. And he is forgiven much, loves much. So when I realize, when I read the word, it's like, wow, God, you love me so much. You love us so much. And you've forgiven us so much. It makes us want to love him more. And then we obey more because the Bible says, uh, this, the, this is the love of God that you obey his commandments and they're not burdensome. We start to realize how much he loves you and who he is. Obeying him doesn't become a burden. It becomes a delight. And when you meditate on his word, uh, it's kind of interesting because I was thinking this morning, Chad, about, uh, and a lot of people have a goal on their New Year's resolution to just read the entire Bible through in a year. And I think that would be a great thing for you to do. It's awesome to just go from Genesis to Revelation. I encourage people to do that all the time. But God is into wide, but he's also into deep. And that's what meditation on the scripture is about, is going deep. And it's interesting because the Greek word for meditate, there's a few different ones, but uh, haga, H-A-G-H-A is how we would transliterate that. It's translated meditate in several places. It talks about how the wicked haga in Psalm chapter two, about how they're going to break God's chains and unite against him. But we're supposed to be meditating on God's word. And when Joshua and also in Psalm 1, it uses the word Haggah. And what's interesting about that word is that word is translated it's about 24 times in the Old Testament. It's used of, to murmur. It could be in a good or a bad way. It's also trans, translated roar, Chad, in the book of Isaiah. And it has a lion roars and Haggah. There is again, that word meditate uh, or, or, or murmur. He Haggahs after his prey. And it has to do with having a hunger for his prey, but we're supposed to have a hunger for God's word. And when you think of having a hunger for God's word, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, like newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, which is able to help you grow in respect to salvation. So the Bible speaks of, of his word as being food. And I love that because that word of God also has the idea of ruminating. And when you think of ruminating, you think of animals that a cow that chews its cud and it would come up and they get more nutrients and they become these big old radical animals that feed millions and millions of people milk and meat. Well, guess what? We're called to give out the milk and meat of the word. And that starts with us chewing Ruminating, the word yeah. and meditating means going deeper. So on a practical level, uh, I believe it's very, very important to memorize scripture. Chad, you quoted yeah. the verse where he says, I've hid your word in my heart so I won't sin against you. And how can a young man keep his way clean but by keeping according to thy word? And the word becomes part of our spiritual DNA as we chew on it and we meditate upon it. So I'm always, and Chad is, as well, I know, meditating on scripture, memorizing scripture. That's one of the best ways to get it is to become part of your uh, spiritual DNA. And John says in 1 John 2, 12 through 14, young men, you are strong You've overcome the porneron, the evil one. How? Because the word of God dwells in you. Mm -hmm. And three mm -hmm. times Jesus whipped out the sword of the spirit. The Bible says it's the word of God when Satan tried to tempt him. And he said, it is written three different times. And it's because he was meditating on a portion of scripture. It's really amazing. You go and look at the three scriptures he quotes. They're all in Deuteronomy, not far from each other, which makes me think that he was in Deuteronomy, Chad, meditating yeah. on the scripture. Because boom, boom, he whipped out three different scriptures that have all applied to what Satan was doing. And I want to encourage you guys to meditate on God's word, to be chewing on it throughout the day and, and thinking about it because your roots will go deeper in the Lord. You'll fall more and more in love with him. So one of the ways to do that is wake up in the morning and say, man, because guess what? How many of you are going to work? And it's like, man, you have a break where you can read the word. You're going to eat. You might be able to have some time to read the word a bit and you need to find time to read the word for sure, right? But guess what you can do all day long? You can meditate on the scripture. We're called and commanded. We're not just called. Chad, we're commanded in the yeah, Bible man. to meditate on the scripture. Eastern mysticism, transcendental meditation, uh, new age, you know, Hollywood type of meditation is about emptying their minds. It's the opposite for us. We're filling our yeah. minds with God's word. They're about being self-focused. We're about being uh, denying ourselves and we're God-focused. Totally different. And I think it's important too. Uh, some say, well, it's just in the Old Testament. It's not in the New. Mm, I would disagree with that because in Timothy, when Paul 
talks to Timothy about the Word of God, and he's actually given him the Word of God, he says, take pain with these things. Uh, the King James translates that word, meditate on these things. Well, does that mean meditate, though? Well, that take pains of things in the Septuagint, the word Haggah is translated with that same Greek word that Paul says, take pain with these things. So there's in the Septuagint, the Greek translates the Old Testament. So that word could easily be translated, meditate uh, on these things. And the King James translation, the New King James translation, a few others translates it, meditate. And by the way, uh, I'm just saying this because guess what, folks? A lot of Christians don't have deep walks. A lot of professing Christians because they've lost the biblical art of meditating on God's word and going deep into his word. So grab us, so pray, God, show me what, what verses you know, to, to memorize and, and what scriptures God puts in your heart, scriptures that you can use for witnessing, scriptures you can use to help you defeat the enemy. Because we're called to put on the whole armor of God, Chad. And part of putting that armor on is so we can defeat the devil in the evil day. Amen. That's what Paul says. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done everything to stand there for. And one of the things he says is to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. No, and it's so important for us to recognize that. And one of the things he had mentioned that will segue is into another thing that you can also plan out for yourself as well is he mentioned how it looks like when you see Jesus there combating Satan, you see him quoting from Deuteronomy. And I would say this as somebody who loves to go out witnessing as well, and I know Joe would say this as well, I cannot tell you how many times there are certain scriptures that were put in my heart to meditate on or certain place wherever I was in the scriptures reading or that exact thing comes up in a conversation with someone that you begin sharing the gospel with or maybe somebody that's struggling with something and all of a sudden they come on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night or something, you're at, you're fellowshipping and they bring something in. You're like, oh, I was just seeing this in the scripture. You got to see this. And it, it is amazing how that happens when you're walking in the will of the Lord, which is meditating on his word and in doing so, fulfilling exactly Amen. what he tells us to. And exactly. And he mentioned different ways to meditate on things. When I was first memorizing scripture, uh, I think of Colossians 3.16, where it says, it's supposed to dwell in you richly. The Amen. Word of God dwelling in you richly, singing and teaching one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It is so often that I would memorize Scripture in a tune. I mean, I, I was in my car, praise God, not everyone was hearing me. Chad's got a great but, voice, by the way. He's but, being humble. But nonetheless, it was like one of those things I'm learning as I'm just, I'll put it to a little tune. There's a worship song that I know, a certain you know melody that I put to that verse, and now I'm singing that verse. And next thing you know, I'm able to remember it. And that specific Is that thing, when you came up with that melody? He has shown thee. Oh, I did not. No, he did not come up with that one. Oh, okay. That's a good one. That's a good one, though. That's, a, a, That's how one. I memorize those verses. We memorized that at our youth uh, our youth conference, actually, with the, with the young guys there. You have no idea how much scripture young people can really memorize, yeah. especially if they're not busy on their phones. I mean, we memorize scripture every single day and big portions of scripture. But anyways... To the next point, and this goes exactly with the memorizing of Scripture, and it goes back to the reality of what Scripture actually says, that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it hits the soul and the spirit, it cuts them up, the bone and the marrow, it can get between there, and and this is important. And I say this alongside of a, a short story. I had a friend of mine who was not walking with the Lord, who I originally had come to the Lord with, and he had done something specifically against me while I was walking in Christ, and it really hurt me. It really, really, it was something that I was like, man, that was mm. really evil. And so I, I just took it before the Lord, and I said, Lord, I'm having a tough time with this. And I just felt the Lord put it on my heart. Don't pray that he will come to Christ. Pray until he does. And so I just began every morning, and I remember at my job at a specific place where I would go to, and I said, this is where I'm going to pray for him every mm. time before I start my shift. And I did. Every night I said, I'm going to resolve. This wasn't a New Year's resolution. It was just something that I had made a resolution. Lord, I want to do this. I want to pray until that man comes back uh, into your grace. And mm. that's exactly what I did. And he eventually did. It took over a year, but it did take place. And, you know, praise God, or I would still be praying about him, but that's moved on to something else. Now, what I'm saying as a practical resolution for that and applying it is maybe think of one specific person, maybe a family member, a cousin, a coworker, whatever it may be. And you say, I'm going to pray about not only myself, because it doesn't have to just be you, some plant, some water, but pray just like how many times, Joe, you've heard this when you were sharing the gospel. 
I have a grandma that prays about me all the time, and I know it. Even though they're not a non-believer, yeah. their grandma, their mom, yeah. somebody, my family is a believer, and you get to be that answer prayer. So also, don't forget that someone else may be your answer prayer for your brother, for your sister, for your friend, for your cousin, whatever it may be, and say, Lord, I, I would love to see them come to know Christ this year. So maybe pick out a person and resolve in yourself, I'm going to keep praying for that person, and Lord, give me opportunities to share with them as well. Yeah, amen, and that's really, really good encouragement, Chad. Uh, something to pray along those lines is one thing I see Paul do more than one time, Chad, is he, he and you don't think, and it always stunned me from the first time I read it to even right now, I get stunned by this, is Paul asks, for instance, the church at Ephesus in chapter 6, verse 18 of Ephesians, you know, he says, pray for me that I would have boldness and that I would know how to speak to I'm like, wow, Paul, I read about you in the book of Acts, and man, you're the you're the witness par excellent, man. It's in in uh and you and but that shows me that Paul recognized a deficiency in himself in regard to boldness. To whatever degree he felt, uh, and I believe God answered the prayers. So it, it shows me because a lot of people are like, Well, you know what, like Moses, you know, I can't speak. He didn't want to speak, and God actually sent Aaron with him, but the Lord God said to Moses, I will be with your mouth. And how many of you are out there and you're thinking, you know what? Yeah, I have our time sometimes just speaking up and, and being bold and, and preaching the gospel and sharing it publicly. Well, guess what? You're in good company. Moses was in that shape and he was the humblest guy on earth. So he didn't think he had all this natural talent and he cried out to God. And guess what? Moses speaks, or do you see Aaron speaking? But guess what? Guess who steps up? You go and you see Moses start speaking boldly. Guess who speaks up over and over again? The apostle Paul with boldness. So I'd encourage you, uh, we, we, we talked to you about being in the Word, being saturated in the Word, reading it and meditating upon it this coming year. Uh, but we've also talked about witnessing and sharing the gospel because that's the Great Commission. Those are our, mission, those are our marching orders to take to the end of the earth. But segueing that with prayer, being a being men and women of prayer, man. Spending The Bible says to pray without ceasing. You know, it's interesting. We look at that scripture at the end of uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, Chad, where he says to be thankful in every circumstance. This is the will of God concerning you. And a lot of people think that he's just talking about being thankful in all circumstances, which is important. And this is the will of God concerning you. It's like, but they don't realize there's two verses right before that where he says to rejoice always, right? And so we're supposed to also uh, rejoice always. And, and we're supposed to be thankful in all, all things. And he also says pray without ceasing. And Paul didn't write in verses where this last verse is what you're supposed to be is God's will. But he wrote those three things and the entire letter, but those three commands specifically, uh, praying without ceasing and rejoicing always and giving thanks in all things are commands that we're supposed to be doing constantly. So we want to encourage you also be praying because all these things go together. You're, you're in the word. You're going to be praying according to his word. You're going to want to share the word. Well, man, I lack boldness. Lord, give me boldness. Open my mouth and show me how to speak and pray that God would set up divine appointments. I found for my own life, that when I pray, God, I'm, and I'm in a place or wherever, and I pray for divine appointments, God has never failed to set me up to where, where it's like my wife and I would just be tripping out. Like, how did that happen? And also I pray, God, help me be creative. Help me to share in certain circumstances that I might miss if I was not attuned to your Holy Spirit. Just recently, Chad, I ran into uh, your wife, which is my daughter, Holly, and I was last minute Christmas shopping. I went to Kohl's and I had to get something for my wife and uh, we need one more gift for my son. End up, I think, getting two or three things. And what happens is I look at the line and I'm like, my day is tight because I have to do all these things. I've got to cook for a bunch of people and everything and get everything ready. And all of a sudden I'm like, you know what? That line, half the cash register shut down on one side of Kohl's. The few that are open has a line and then it goes all the way to the side. I'm like looking and I go to the side. I see it turns. How far does it turn? It turns like 35 more people back or so. I'm like, and Holly goes, dad, that's going to be an hour and a half. Wait. And I'm like, oh, Lord, God, what am I going to do? And Holly goes, Dad, why don't you go back to where you got that perfume? Well, we think she'll take us. I go, you come with me. We went in right away. We got done in minutes. And we're headed to the door. And Holly, Holly goes, where are you going? I go, I'm going to go talk to the people at the very end of that line. She goes, Dad, you don't need to do that. And I go, I've got a plan. I want to, I want to bless them. And I got to tell them two tips, give them two tips. So my first tip, I went to the last 10 people. I go, hey, you guys, I got two tips for you. This is boldness that comes from Jesus. I wouldn't normally do this in the past. And they're like listening. Two tips. Number one, you don't have to wait in this line for the next hour, hour and a half. You can just go over here. I told them where to go. And I go, that's number one. I go, number two, we're celebrating Christ's birth tomorrow. It's Jesus that came as the Savior of the world. And I go, and guess what? He came 
So not worse than this line, you don't have to spend eternity in hell. You could be saved if you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I gave him a short version of the gospel. And by the way, there's one believer in line because he's like, amen, amen, buddy, amen. <laughs> it was so cool. So you, you pray for divine appointments. You pray that God would give you boldness. And let's just be a light for the Lord in this coming year. Well, praise God. You know, I think that's so huge. And I know, I, I guess we can give a, a, an abridged version. We only got about 30 seconds here, Joe. But I know in terms of a vision of where the, where this ministry is going, as well as the fellowship, and um, it all has to do with Jesus. And uh, we're going to make sure that we cling to Jesus, that we honor him, that he is glorified, and ultimately that we can not only, and this what this channel is about, is bringing the gospel right to you and that you can share it, but also making sure that we can edify the body of Christ so that just as hopefully that guy who was in that line said, you know what, I need to be encouraged also to go share the gospel because I can do that too. And Amen. that's what we want to do is glorify God, edify the body, and bring the gospel to the streets. Amen. We love you guys. Press on. Have a great new year. Hey, Joe Schimmel here. We want to thank you for watching. We want to also encourage you not to forget to sign up or subscribe to Good Fight Ministries' YouTube channel. We have the most amazing content. We have a very popular Good Fight radio show where we examine all kinds of things in light of Scripture, as well as 511 News, which is also very eye-opening. And we also have mind-blowing video exposés that you won't see anywhere else. So thanks again. We'll see you later. And we just pray that the Lord blesses you richly as you seek His face. And this week's featured product is the Kinsey Syndrome. You can check this out at goodfight.org. God bless you guys.